Welcome to Just Men, a life-changing program that resonates hope as well as encouragement. The program that gives you information and inspiration for the glory of God. I'm your host, Jeff Tate, and thank you for joining Just Men. On today's program, we have a very special guest. This is his first time being on Just Men. Please welcome Jimmy Coleman. Brother Coleman, welcome to Just Men. Thank you, sir, for the invitation. We're just delighted on what God is going to kind of share through your heart, and there's so much that we can talk about. But before we dive into the depths of your life, share just briefly who is Jimmy Coleman. Uh, Jimmy Coleman, I live in uh, Tullahoma, Tennessee, uh, married, have three children. Share a little bit about your life and your upbringing, particularly when it relates to manhood and what did you have certain men in your life, like a father or a mentor or a surrogate father, who really shaped you and gave you a sense of who you were as a man. Talk a little bit about that, that background. And my background, I grew up in a small town in West Tennessee in Humboldt. Uh, there was a man, I, his, he had a son, uh, Mr. Nunn, who lived across the street and uh, he was a college professor. And so he would carry me around with everywhere they would go, I would go, sort of like a part of the family. My mother and grandmother raised me. And there's another man, uh, Willie Bond. He was a barber and a principal at a high school. So those two guys were instrumental in my life as, when I was growing up. Yeah, wow. Now, I noticed that you didn't say anything about a father. Talk a bit about that part of it, or did you? you know, no, no father in the home. Mother and grandmother raised me, and uh, so uh, the only father figures I had were Mr. Nunn and Mr. Bond. Mm, that wow. Was it. Now, what message it really sort of resonate uh, once you look back on how they model what it was to be a man and give you a sense of direction? Is there any particular message that would resonate or a direction that they gave you about manhood? Yeah, both of them were hardworking men. Uh, you know, being a professor at a university and uh, and taking me around and just being in his presence. You know, song how he raised his children and Mr. Bond, he was a, a pastor and as well as a barber and a principal. So we had about three full hats and uh, just sitting around him, going to the barber shop, just talking with him throughout the day. Sometimes was uh, was the thing. Just seeing how those men would uh, well take on the young men in the community that had no fathers and, and will give instructions and, and be there for them. Wow, man, that is awesome. Share a little bit about how that message, or at least seeing them model that sense of community, how that has shaped your life and, and some of the choices that you made in life. Right, even at the present time, you know, at, uh, when I uh, look back over that, I find myself doing the same thing they were doing. Uh, again, I like to mentor young men and. Uh, had a mentoring program working with young men in my community and uh, just try to keep them on a straight path to, uh, to being successful in life and at the same time always remember no matter what they may achieve in life uh, always remember to keep God first. Mm, wow that's good. What are you see as you mentoring these men what do you see are some of the challenges that they're facing that you can see maybe even some of the challenges you even faced as a young man adolescent? A lot of challenges but most of them would mostly be pure pressure from quite a few of them, uh, being the pressure of uh, trying to serve the Lord and, and save the world, serve, serve the world at the same time. And uh, so it's a struggle. And then sometimes going home, uh, back into the household where no one may attend church, uh, have a sense of direction of who Jesus Christ really is. And uh, so it's a struggle uh, at times, just trying to keep that balance. Yeah. Did you have that struggle, even though you had those mentors and you had that sort of surrogate father? Uh, oh, yes, sir, of course. Had that struggle, uh, leaving uh, Humboldt, going off to school at Tennessee State. And uh, uh, it was a struggle when you, when you leave home. Sometimes you forget everything you uh, ever, ever taught or shown growing up and because you meet so many people from uh, various walks of life. And uh, living in a dorm uh, situation, you meet so many different guys. And you pick up some good habits, some bad. But uh, somehow or another, it uh, leads you back to that starting foundation, which was Christ. Mm -hmm. And so and from there on to the military, uh, going there, uh, you know, I lost a little, little sense of purpose when I uh, went to the military. Going in there as a brand new military officer in the Air Force, uh, you get a little prideful, uh, when, especially when everybody stands to salute you when you walk in and you lose, you, you lose a sense of uh, what you've learned as a child growing up with until uh, you have some things in life to hit you and put you back on a on path of where you should be. Mm. Let's talk a little bit and, and, and really build on our foundation. I, I, can sh I know exactly what you're saying in terms of it's like the road to Damascus. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes we get knocked off our horse, and through that knocking off the horse, we get a sense of direction. The Bible says when Saul was knocked off his horse, the Spirit put him on a street called Straight. And through that street called Straight, obviously we get you know, three-quarters of the New Testament of, 
of Paul's witness of this walk with God. And building on that, what, when you look back, has been one of the strongest challenges of your faith uh, that really kind of catapult you into a whole new sense of direction when you start talking about challenges and you're talking about sometimes things happening to bring in an awakening. You know, even with the uh, awakening from the military situation was when uh, you end up in church, when you began to work in church and do things and you're just going, 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 you're helping young people and uh, you're studying God's word and then things even happen in, in church because when we spoke earlier we talked about uh, some people get caught up a little bit with religion and not really knowing Jesus and uh, then you find yourself you're knocked down again and that's when a sense of reality set in said you know you put a lot of trust in people and you you were doing a lot of things for me that you said you were doing but then you sometimes you just lose focus even there and then when when you fall down from even in church then you begin to uh, really seek God you cry out to him uh, to help you and that's when it happened for me, you know. It's just when my life has really changed. Uh, when you begin, to, when you fall, and and you, no one's there, pick you up but him. He's there, and everybody else deserts you. He he's the one that's there. And well, even when you lose your job, you you out there, you're in the trenches now. Uh, as a program I've been working on called Men in the Trenches, uh, it's with men who have been on top and they find themselves on the bottom, and uh, then they find themselves in the trenches whereby they don't have that job, they don't have the friends, or everybody's gone, and, but someone had to be there to pick them up and give them that sense of direction once again and to keep getting, remind them of their purpose. Mm. You know, that's a powerful message because I know, just like you expressed, I run into so many men who have been broken and hurt by the church uh, through religion, uh, through relationships where they built this sort of false image of what they thought the church was supposed to be and represent. In many instances, they felt that the church would represent God uh, in many aspects. In fact, many times as men or as people, they would substitute God for the church. Uh, the church begins to be who they serve. The church becomes that who they worship uh, and not realizing that truly that's just a conduit to bring you into the ultimate relationship with God. And so I, I, that is a strong message when you start talking about finding brokenness through religion, uh, and yet through that you end up developing relationship and developing empowerment and understanding a new message about Christ and the hope of glory that's on the inside of you. Talk about that transformation and what what you, what did you do with it? I mean, once you once you come to that awakening, you know how do you embrace the church now, and how do you embrace your brothers who before may have deserted you, you know, but yet still got to walk this path of love and, and forgiveness. Talk a little bit about that. Oh, even uh, with those who were around you and deserted you, you, you get a sense of saying, I, I understand that I still have to love them regardless of what, have, what has happened. And you have to show them the crisis in you, show that you have uh, moved above uh, everything that's actually happened in your life. And you begin to still reach out to them. They call upon you. You still be readily available to assist them in anything they may need. And so it was a better thing just to always show them and, and the things that we, we do in the, in the walk that we have in life. And it's the thing that we have to do mm -hmm. to, to rise above anything we go through. Yeah, Paul says that his life is not his, that has been purchased by the blood of Jesus. And it's not I that live, but it's he that lives in me. That's right. And, uh, and sometimes it's so painful because when you begin to what I call serve the God of the mind, where the mind tells you, that you are this, you are that, you are to do this, you are to do that. And sometimes it operates contrary to the spirit of God. Uh, then you develop these, these addictions, uh, you know, to people. That was one of the challenges I had in life was being addicted to people. You know, they, be, they became my, my value system. They became my significance. In other mm -hmm. words, how did I look significant in their eyes uh, as opposed to how was I significant in the eyes of the Father, in the eyes of God? And many times the relationship was very manipulative. Mm -hmm. One thing about God that I understand and you can attest to is God knows your agenda and he knows your motives. Mm -hmm. And you can't manipulate him. 
you know, and sometimes we'll come to people with half of the story, you know, to get their support. And yet still, um, God knows our heart, and he's trying to transform the heart. He allows us to continue to go through the pain and the suffering. And the mind would tell you that that is the enemy, that that is Satan that is chastising you and is correcting you and putting you on the path called straight. It's amazing. We will blame and give credit to the devil in so many things that God himself is the one who's orchestrating and putting us through the pain, the fiery pain, to purge that that is unlike him away from us. And yet we would say it's the enemy and it's the devil and it's so, so forth. So um, it's just amazing uh, the mindset and how it can take on its own identity and pull you away from the true identity of who you are as the image and likeness of God. And so I say that to say that as we are transformed to reflect his image, the Bible says from glory to glory by the Spirit of God, it said we behold as in a mirror in a glass, darkly or dimly. Um, as you see your life looking back on this transformation, um, what would you say is one of the most pivotal thing in your life to help you do that? What did you use to help you to really get your life on track? Uh, the, the broken experience uh, from church, uh, that, that really uh, got me on track. And I look back, uh, he was still working on me at the same time coming out of the military uh, mm. when you're so prideful. So he had to use something to break your pride. Mm. Uh, so when, when, you know, pride says pride comes before the fall. Mm. And so uh, I, I know that quite well. So when you get very prideful, God will bring you down it, uh, and let you know that hey, it's me. Uh, I, I'm what you need. No matter what you obtain in life, it's, it's all about him. And so from there, I began to just seek him more and, and begin to, be, to develop and grow uh, and by just studying up his word and, and spending an intimate time with him. And uh, that's a little quiet time going to my own Gethsemane and to, in my own garden just to, to call upon him. Mm. Wow, that's awesome. And, that, and that's the point that I really wanted you to, to pull out because many people uh, come up with a three-step program, a five-step or a ten-step program uh, to help them to be delivered. And, uh, and your, as I understand, yours is just surrender. Surrender. Um, you know, I mean, that, that, that there is no steps but towards him. <laughs> that's the step. Yes, sir. The steps towards him and allow him to do the purging and him to do the molding as the, the potter and the clay process, you know, to where he shapes. The Bible says that when, when, when we go down to the potter's house, we'll see them, the father working on the wheel and, and, and purging that which is unlike him, that which has been scarred and disfigured, and to create it as a new vessel. And it's amazing how he does it in our lives as we surrender, you know, to him. Uh, but it's very hard. Uh, because we have become so accustomed to the citizenship of this world. And that's always amazing to me, uh, is that the citizenship of this world, uh, we are surprised that we come under so much scrutiny and attack when we are a citizen of this world. And it is God's citizenship that we truly should operate in to give us the peace and joy and love, as the prodigal son did. He, he turned, you know, and came back to himself. Uh, so, I mean, I think this is just a beautiful process as we allow and surrender, I like what you said, to God in, in that process. What's been on your heart uh, in terms of what God has been ministering to you in these days uh, as it relates not only just in, I want to start with, with, uh, with marriage and family uh, and then grow from there in terms of just the community and the sense of, of connection with our young people. Let's start with the family first. Uh, uh, with marriage and, and, and you have children. So let's talk a bit about the family structure and what God has placed on your heart. All right, the family structure, I have uh, two boys and a girl. And uh, my wife has been married 22 years. And uh, so my wife, she has mainly been the college that, that pushed me in the direction of uh, being with Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she was the prayer warrior in the house. And, and uh, I was, uh, as we call, we the, I'm the breadwinner. She do the praying to children, do everything, and I'm just working. And then, like I said, when that brokenness come in, and then you begin to see what she's talking about. And then you begin to seek God as well with her and begin to come together and pray. And then the children join in. And, 
And then once they leave home, you know, they begin to do the same things in the colleges and their work in the workplace as well. And so uh, they had to model that, even though the mother started it, and I had to pick it up. And uh, so then they begin to see their father do it. And so it, uh, it makes a difference. Even though they still call on mom, they still look for me also to see whether or not uh, his dad is he in prayer also. So uh, it, we have to join in hand in hand, the two of us together, in order to make it work. Wow. How significant is that, especially having not seen your father uh, model or exemplify that? How do you feel that that's been significant in your children's lives? You know, I purposed myself when I, when I got married, I said, uh, I know what it's like to not have a father available around to teach me things and to allow someone else in the community. And I, I made a I purpose of myself that uh, I was going to be there for my children. I said, no matter what happens, what's going on, I have to be there for them. And, uh, and just modeled and seeing what the other men were doing when I was growing up and seeing them in prayer and in church. So that inspired me to see that I can do the same thing. You know, and I'm going to teach them. I'm not just going to send them. Uh, they're going to go. We're all going to go together. Mm. Wow. So would it say or fairly say that not just being a breadwinner mm -hmm. is sufficient, mm -hmm. uh, that you need to be more in terms of what true representation of a father or a husband should exemplify? He should exemplify Christ mm. because uh, I learned that the breadwinner can lose it. You can lose it all. Mm. And then what do you have if that's all you're relying on? But even if you lose it all and you have Christ, then we know that he's able to keep us and he can bring us through any situation. Because I've been there. Mm, wow, that's beautiful. Talk about the sense of community and what the Father has placed in your heart in terms of community. In community, I, I see as a, so many young guys with uh, no direction or no purpose. And uh, I, I would like to, that Men in the Trenches program, I would like to just get that off the ground and running and just bring young men in just to minister to them and, and uh, you know, have uh, tutoring programs just to teach them, uh, you know, get them through the things they need to get through, fill out job applications, knowing how to interview and know how to present themselves as young men and, and then just feed them God's word, replace whatever's in them with the word of God. And then uh, because like Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto thee. And so just teaching them to seek God for no matter what's going on in their lives. If they seek him, everything else is going to work out. Wow, that is awesome. You know, it's a powerful message too. I mean, you and I know that it works. Uh, mm -hmm. I know as a young man, I didn't think it worked. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm like, nah. I'm like, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this my way. You know, mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find my own way and navigate through life and because uh, this, this, this religious, spiritual walk uh, wasn't for me. And it's amazing uh, how uh, that road in which we're talking about, that road of life kind of brings you back to the true essence of life. Mm -hmm. And that is with him. It is with God. And I found that the spiritual path, its purpose is to unearth the true treasure that's on the inside of you. The treasure of God is on the inside of each one of us. And the way you tap into it is through the spirit. Mm -hmm. It is through, like you said, to get the relationship with God, not the religion with God, but the relationship with God, the intimacy with God, the, the, the yearning for God, the search for God, the heart for God, uh, the connecting with God through our hearts and not just our minds, I think just transforms us. Uh, myself, I had an intellect, I had a, a mental uh, uh, acceptance of God, but I didn't have the, the, the heart connection. Right. You know, it's the heart that, that, that God is, is searching for and to bring forth is the heart. And so uh, I believe that is what's going to bring about the transformation. Another thing that you spoke of, and I, and I think is very powerful, and I want to kind of bring to surface with young men when you say that they have a sense of lost direction. Uh, why is that? Let's talk a little bit about that as as uh, kind of looking in hindsight, uh, why do you think young people don't have a sense of purpose, a sense of mission or direction? Uh, because of uh, what they see, uh, older men do. Mm -hmm. uh, they may see you going to church, but then they may see you somewhere else. And uh, that hurts them to say, well, if, if he, he's fallen, well, it's, you know, if it got him, it's going to get me. And so then that, they, they lose all hope and all purpose when they see someone who will be a pillow or model in the community. 
and uh, they falter. And so that's why uh, you can't trust even the ones you see even in the church and doing things. You, that's why you have to know Christ for yourself. And that's why I want to instill in the young man. You have to know him for yourself. You have to read and study his word. And uh, Brother Jim, Jimmy may fall. But you, you have to know that I, you know, even though he may be that model, but I can't put all my trust in Brother Jimmy. I have to ensure I have all my trust in Jesus. And so that's why I have to just study that word and know it for myself. And then at the same time, I can't condemn Brother Jimmy if he falls. I'm going to be able to be there to pick him up and be in prayer for him. Wow, man, that's awesome. You know, as you were speaking, and I thought about uh, Christ says, if my name be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And as I begin to, to meditate on God's word about lifting Christ up, the word that came in my spirit is that if I allow the spirit of God, the image of God, the hope of glory on the inside of me to be illuminated, that illumination will draw men unto him. And many times, and I think you hit the nail on the head, is that as men sometimes we live this hypocritical life. Uh, we want to turn the light on when we're in a church. Then we want to turn the light down, you know, when we want to live our own Saturdays and Friday nights and, and that way. But, but we got to keep the light on and, and let Christ be illuminated in us 24-7. That his life, that he is the beacon of light that's inside of us that's going to draw men unto Christ to bring about the transformation in our own life. Because the very light that's on the inside of us it's also on the inside of them. And I've said that what you identify is what you energize and what you magnify. So if you identify with Christ, then Christ is going to be magnified inside of you. And it's going to energize Christ. But if you identify with the negative and the false sense of, of identity, then that's what's going to be magnified. Uh, so my question and i always tell the young people and i got a word for them it's really burning in my heart is to begin to teach our young people about the secret place see the secret place is is somehow we, we we've forgotten that the secret place is really how you and i have been transformed uh, psalms 91 talks about the secret place you know it says he who dwells in the secret place you know of the most high and it talks about that he's our refuge, he's our fortress, you know, that in there is protection, there's wealth, there's prosperity, there's welfare, there's all these things in the secret place of the Most High, which you and I would call the presence of God, bringing us into the presence. So then when my life is not reflecting the glory of God or the image of God or the light of God, I have to ask myself, where am I? Where is my habitation? See, you can't just drop by the secret place. No, no, no. You, you, you got to go there and, and, and inhabitate. You know what I'm saying? You got to dwell there and stay there in order that you may be filled. And that now you don't have to go, as you talked about a little bit, going to Jacob's well to get your cup filled, like the woman at the well. You know, Jesus says, no, there's a well on the inside of you. There's a well flowing inside of you. The spirit of God is flowing and released inside of you. So you don't have to go to man. He's in you. The very thing you're seeking and searching for is inside of you. If you would open up and go within. And that's the secret place. And it's amazing why he called it a secret place. Because many times, what do we do? We look for answers everywhere outside of ourselves, but within. What's on your heart? as I said and as I shared, because there's something that I know is on your heart, just in what I just shared in terms of just this awakening and what we need to do as men in order that we may ignite the spirit of God in our young men, in our families, in our workplaces, and everywhere around us. What's on your heart as it relates to that? Uh, we have to just be available to show them. Mm -hmm. uh, and to, as I stated before, do you have to Start off with letting them read that word and see it read in the beginning where it says, uh, he breathed the breath of life into you, mm -hmm. knowing that uh, Christ, he is, he's in you. We just got to unearth everything else that's on top of it for him to be able to come out. Mm -hmm. And then once, once he appears and once they have an encounter with him, then uh, I think lives of these young men will really be changed. Mm 
It's, it's not so much of what we preach or what we teach, but it's uh, the life that we live before them that makes the big difference, that makes the difference. Now see, that's resonating to me. The life we live before them, it gets beyond the rhetoric. I mean, I, just because I can exegete the scripture and I can, I have charisma when I present the word and I can dance and shout, I can sing, I have talent. Mm -hmm. But many times you don't see the power. Uh, and that's what people are, are hungry for, is the, the power of God, the presence of God. Every time when we read in scripture and someone had an encounter with God, there was change. That's how they knew that they had an encounter with God. The power of God either brought the, the deaf to where they can hear, the blind that they can see, the lame that they can walk. There was a power that was released by their encounter with the presence of God. Last word of encouragement. Well, here's where I would say that uh, we just continue to seek him. No matter what stage of life we're in right now, uh, we have to still continue to go higher and higher in them, go to all those levels from inner court to outer court to the most holy of holies, to where he, he dwells, whereby we can just hear his voice. Uh, no matter where we are and what's going on in our lives, we know that he, he's always there. As he said, he'll never leave us, nor will he forsake us. And uh, we have to relieve that in our hearts and, and uh, just just count on that. That's, that's, that's the essence of all of it all, that he's there for us. Wow, that's awesome. Stay focused. Man, 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 that's awesome. <laughs>